Mike Brown, the former FEMA director. Joining us here is the former FEMA director. History, I think, was very unkind to you, my friend. Very unkind. Mr. Brown, thanks for being with us. This is Michael Brown Unplugged. Happy Friday, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Michael Brown Unplugged. Let's get started. Christian Toto. See if I can get him pulled up here on Skype, and we'll do a Hollywood in Toto. And I got Mr. Toto up on Skype. Let's go. What do you got for me today, Mr. Toto? By the way, happy Friday. Happy Friday. Yeah. So what you got? You we touched on the hunt last week, and we talked a little bit about what was going on in the movie where seemingly elites were literally hunting down horrible types. It was going to come out next month. And since we last spoke, uh, we yanked off the schedule. We will not September 27th. And uh, more about it as well, including the, the key players behind the movie, is he's okay with the movie being yanked off the schedule. Shocked me. So what's really going on? Because I, I last week when we talked about it, before the cancellation, you had mentioned something about you thought there was maybe more to this whole kerfuffle. Because seemingly the good guys were the deplorables that were be hunt- being hunted by the bad guys. And, and the more I read, then you peaked, that piqued my curiosity, sticking around. And it appears that that was the case. The deplorables were depicted as the good guys. And the bad guys were the ones on the other side. They were hunting them down. Does that play into this at all? I don't know. And I also don't know. If that's truly the complete story, it certainly is what it looks like on the surface. And even if you watch the trailer, the people who are being hunted are displayed as heroic and strong. So, you know, I I think there's got to be a twist here, maybe a third act little kind of uh, surprise that maybe shakes up what's going on. But again, not enough people have seen it. They only have maybe one or two test screenings and no critics have really weighed in yet. And you haven't seen it. You didn't get a screen or anything. No, you know, for a wide release like this, I often don't. I'll get a um, an invite to the screening, but that often happens like a couple of weeks before the movie opens. So we didn't get close enough yet. So what do you think is really going on here? Well, on, I mean, I think on, they're come on. What, cowardly. Do you, what, do you, what do you really think? What do you think is going on? There's got to be a twist to the movie. It can't be as described because Hollywood is anti-Trump. This filmmaker, uh, Jason Bloom, is anti-Trump. Uh, One of the actors, uh, Baron Holtz, is extraordinarily anti-Trump. I don't think they would have all signed on if there wasn't something more than we're seeing. But I think just because the jittery nature of the times with those mass shootings and the fact that Trump was trying to connect it, even though they canceled it before Trump spoke out, I I just think they all got got cold feet. Okay, so I want to back up. Let me I want to pick your brain. I got to cross examine here. You seem to think that there might be a twist in the plot that makes it worse than what it seems to be on the surface, and that might be part of the reason why they've backed off? No, I mean, I just think the movie itself, take away the controversy, why would an industry that's anti-Trump and a filmmaker who's anti-Trump and actors who are anti-Trump rally together to make a movie where the deplorables are the heroes Again, that's what it looks like on the surface. So I, I just can't square that in my head that all these different people would come together to make a movie that had that message. And then you mentioned to me before we started that one of the actors, I, I forgive me, I think you just said it, that he said somewhere that he's actually okay with this thing being canceled? Well, the person I've been referring to is Jason Bloom. He, the director. He, he's actually a director. He's behind a lot of very powerful. Hollywood movies. He's very successful. He's very anti-Trump. And so this is really his baby. It's Bloomhouse Productions. So what shocked me was that he reportedly, according to one press outlet report, was okay with them pulling it right now. I guess he agreed it wasn't the right time. But, you know, why do it in the first place? Why the theme? Uh, didn't he realize that this was going to be a powder keg in our culture wars? So do you think it's going to pop up? say, closer to the 2020 election? Gosh, I mean, if it's hot <laughs> now, it, how could it be It'd be even hotter then? I really don't know the movie's fate. fate. I, I, this talk, it may be released internationally. Maybe they'll slip it onto a Netflix down the road. But for the next year plus, it's only going to get hotter. So if you're going to pull it now, 
what's the reason to putting it out any time after that? Unless there's something about the fact we're going on the basis that an assumption that the people being hunted, the deplorables, are depicted in a good way. Right. What if the people being hunted, the deplorables, are actually depicted in a really negative light? And so those on the other side who are doing hunting are actually going and killing people who are being depicted as Trump supporters. But as Trump supporters, they're racist, homophobes, xenobes, whatever, whatever the current adjective is. Yeah, I mean, very real possibilities, but I think the bottom line, the fight between the left and the right been, at least in my lifetime, this severe, people on each side are blaming the rhetoric and destructions and shootings. How do you put a subject matter like into theaters and say, have at it, folks? That, I mean, that's the part that I can't square with. Now, I, I don't think they right, should me- do what they want. They can say what they want, but also a bit of responsibility here. I mean, do you understand that, that that could cause repercussions? I mean, I think the filmmakers should be aware of it. All right. Maybe I'm overthinking it because I'm trying to – I don't know. I, I, I haven't been to a movie in so long because, frankly, there hasn't been really anything to go watch or that you've told me, hey, you must go see this. Are there any other movies out right now? Not necessarily where it's – they're hunting down people. But where they're the the typical violent movies, you know, a Die Hard movie, or you know, we watched, um, I believe we watched it, but on Netflix there was some Sean Penn movie that's three or four years, uh, The Gun or something. I think we watched. It was incredibly violent, with lots of automatic weapons, lot and assassination, all all sorts of things. If they're pulling this one forgetting about whether or not the deplorables are depicted as good or bad people. Are there any other movies right now that, in terms of just the violence and the use of firearms and guns and everything else, that are out right now that nobody's saying anything about? Yeah, there's a movie coming out very soon. Um, I think it's called Ready or Not, and I've seen the trailers. It comes out at the end of this month, and it's about a couple that gets married, but that the the groom's family has very nasty things in store for the bride or something akin to that. And the early reviews are out and it sounds extraordinarily violent, bloody. And there's a little bit of satire in there. It's sort of an attack on the rich. But I think that really falls into the camp you're discussing where, hey, uh, there's a lot of violence on the screen above and beyond this movie, The Hunt. And then next month, we're going to see the last Rambo film, literally called Last Rambo. And according to the trailer and according to the Rambo franchise, action, blood, violence, guns, mayhem. So, I mean, Hollywood is addicted to this kind of storytelling. There's nothing – nothing is going to change there. And you could certainly say it's hypocritical to sort of bemoan the violence in the hunt and then celebrate the violence elsewhere. Okay, so I guess the bottom line is the hunt's, the hunt's going away, but yet Hollywood's going to continue to produce violent, gun-riddled movies. So – to your point, there's something odd about the pulling and cancellation of this movie, unless it's just yeah. the fact that they're killing innocent people or something. Yeah, I think there's more shoes to be dropped about this. I'm just I'm just so curious to see it for multiple reasons. But again, you know, I mentioned the responsibility factor, but I, I artists should I don't, I don't like art being pulled. I, I, I agree. And, you know, and also, you know, it is part of what we have in, in our country that. We have the right to make what we want to make, to share what we want to share. And if it inspires something terrible, that is our culture. We can't really change that. I mean, you know, Taxi Driver was connected to Jodie Foster, was connected to John Hinckley. Uh, There have been comments about Oliver Stone films that maybe uh, some killers have have used. It's it's just where we are. It's 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 the horrible we paid for a culture where the art what they please that that's we embrace well and the bottom line is if you live in a free free and open society where people are free to say whatever they want to say or to produce what they want to say there will always be a nut job somewhere who's going to try to draw a connection between something he saw or read i mean good grief we're talking about movies think about all of the things and that that are in writing out there whether it's you know an, a published book or it's just some speed that's on the internet somewhere. So when we're in an open society like this, 
for people to pull a movie because they're afraid there's causal link or it might inspire somebody to do or not do something. I just think that's so tenuous. And I also think it's a, it's a, it's one of the hard cold facts of living in, I'm, I'm going to qualify this in a second, but living in an open society where people can speak their minds, write whatever they want to paint, draw, whatever they want to put on the screen, whatever they want to. That's just, the result of living in a society like that. On the other hand, if you live in a closed society, China, Venezuela, Cuba, whatever it might be, bad things still happen. So they not have something that they're reading online, but still crimes are committed. This whole idea that by pulling a movie, you're going to perhaps keep one individual. I guess if it saves one life, that's the mantra of the left. But if it just keeps one individual from doing something bad, then it's worth it. I just, I just think that's nuts. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a good conversation to have, though, I will say. It's important to discuss these things. But uh, another thing, another wrinkle here is that, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think Hollywood Inc. has said boo about this movie. You know, we have all these actors who are very vocal about politics and immigration and, you know, all sorts of issues. And that's, again, that's their right to speak up. You would think if I'm an actor and I see an, a, a film being pulled, I'd be kind of grumpy about it. That I'd be, hey, it's all about free expression, but they're running scared in Hollywood. I'm not seeing anyone talking about it. All right. Well, keep digging. I want to know the truth about what's really going on. Yeah. Okay, so over at your website, HollywoodInToto.com. By the way, I guess we should mention they should people should follow you on Twitter at HollywoodInToto. And, and they should also go to your website, HollywoodInToto.com. Okay, so Mr. Toto, by the way, I need to remind people that if they want to uh, follow you on Twitter, they need to do so uh, at uh, HollywoodInToto. Or if they want to uh, go to your website, it is HollywoodInToto.com. You have a story up over there, headline. Again, a great headline. Columbia Journalism Review targets white male critics. Are you, well, you are a white male critic. Last time I checked. <laughs> <laughs> so what's, and I'm shocked that the Columbia Journalism Review <laughs> target critics not based on their work product, but based upon their gender. The entire piece reads like a social justice warrior kind of venting. And listen, I, I don't have a problem with that. We can all have a debate on things, but it seems like a, a, a publication with the word journalism in the title might be a little bit more rigorous and maybe less one-sided. The story looks at uh, allegations that if you're a male critic, you're less willing to like movies like Ocean's Aid or those Lady Ghostbusters. And so it kind of goes off in that tangent. It mentions how there's a new website that is for – uh, female identifying critics and non-binary critics. And again, you want to make a website and run it that way, have at it. I have no problem with that. The more voices, the better. But there's a sort of assumption that male and female critics review things dramatically differently or differently enough where it's a problem, where you have to kind of force it to be equal. And that's what the, the story says. And it also attacks Rotten Tomatoes because in their eyes, they don't have enough female critics. So it, again, it's a much more complicated issue. But the other beef I have with this particular story is that if you want to look at a a diversity issue that truly dramatically impacts a review, it's ideology. The vast majority of critics are left of center. Many are aggressively left of center, as we're seeing, and that impacts the kind of reviews they write. If it's a Christian movie, it's propaganda. If it's a Michael Moore movie, it's triumphant. I mean, if you want to investigate biases in journalism and I'm sorry, in movie criticism, that's where you start. And of course, the article doesn't even hint at that, let alone mention it. This, this is identity politics run amok. So you, you have in the story, you quote something. I assume this is from the, from the story. Though Rotten Tomatoes is often thought of as neutral, its critics, like film critics at large, skew mostly white and male. Only 34% of all critics featured on Rotten Tomatoes are women, according to a recent study by Martha Lowes, an executive director at the Center for the Study of Women in Television and Film at San Diego, San Diego State University. So my question is maybe, and you may not, I hate to throw this at you, you may not know the answer to it, but if 34% of the critics featured on Rotten Tomatoes are women, among the pool of critics are 34% women and... 
you know, 66% male? I mean, what, what, what is it? Well, I don't know the specific numbers. I suspect that there's an imbalance there in general, quite possibly. But also, you know, you need to get to a certain level of exposure to get access to Rotten Tomatoes. Now, I, I got that years ago. I was working at the Washington Times. And because I was a Times regular critic, I was able to access Rotten Tomatoes. And ever since then, gosh, about 15, 16 years now, my reviews are on the site. So if I review a new James Bond movie, I will link it to from Rotten Tomatoes to my website. So if you go to Rotten Tomatoes, you can find out what I have to say. So I would think that Rotten Tomatoes, unless they kind of game the system, can only link to as many people who have a large audience and who review movies. And, you know, unless they go searching for female critics, for critics of color, they, I don't think it's their fault. They, they're just kind of, you know, reaching out to the people who do the do the reviewing. Which is another reason why this whole concept of identity politics drives me nuts. Because if, if the ratio is, you know, 34 to 66 percent, if, that, if that's mm. what the ratio is of female to male, not even getting into black versus white or mm. non-binary or whatever the else, whatever, uh, what other category you want to throw in there. If that is just the natural, because there, it's not like you well, – I guess you could go to film school. You could go – get a journalism degree or you could do what, you know, some sort of fine arts program. But that's a choice that individuals make. So if if two thirds males decide to to do that and become critics and only one third women decide to do so, irrespective or regardless of what the proportion of is to the general population at large, Mm -hmm. those are just the number of people have chosen to follow that profession. So why should we care? Uh, we, we shouldn't care. I mean, if they're all doing the job properly, then that's what matters. It actually reminds me a little bit of a, a this is sort of a tangent, but it's not really. There's been articles in the last maybe 10 or so years about the number of black baseball players, I think, has either declined or is fairly low. There's some sort of issue where there aren't as many black people playing baseball. You know, there's Puerto Rican players, there's Venezuelan players, there's American players, Canadian, whatever. And I'm thinking, who cares? Because if a player has talent Every major league team wants him on the team, period. They're not going to say, boy, that, that guy's – boy, he's a five-tool player, but he's black. We're not going to hire – no, no no baseball executive in 2019 would ever say that because, of course, Jackie Robinson broke the, the color barrier and, and is a hero for doing that. But in today's baseball, it's all about talent. Well, wait, and wait, so, whoa, 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 whoa. All athletic – programs, I mean, regardless oh, of whether yeah. it's professional or amateur or whatever, is a meritocracy. It's based upon someone's merit. So, yes. so, so if if people are now bitching about the, the lack of black baseball players versus, mm-hmm. I guess, what, what, to your point, white, Latino, Puerto Rican, Cuban, or whatever, wait a minute, let's talk about the National Basketball, the NBA. What, well, yeah. Wait a minute. Mo, they're, I mean, I don't, I'm not a big NBA fan, so I don't know, but just based on the cursory <laughs> passing of there's an NBA game on television, it appears to me to be predominantly black. And that's OK. I mean, as long as the burden to entry is not there, all you need is talent. And I, I don't see where it's an issue. But again, listen, the film issue is more complicated, you could say. And you could also argue that if I'm a male critic, I might be more a little bit more amenable with a, a dumb action movie than a female. But then that's also gender stereotypes, too. And that gets into another slippery slope. So it, it's complicated. And just maybe this, maybe I shouldn't say this. Maybe this is sort of self-serving. But I recently watched Always Be My Maybe. It's got it's a romantic comedy with two Asian stars. I thought it was an absolute train wreck, and I said so on my website. <laughs> and then I also saw The Farewell, which was a completely Asian cast, and it's maybe one of my favorite movies of the year. I don't give a darn what the people on screen are. I just want to be entertained. I mean, I think that's what we should focus it on. Make good stories. Let people, everyone have an opportunity to make the stories and then have people review the stories. And if you're a person of color and you want to start a blog and review movies and gain an audience, then God bless you. Go do it. You've got the website. Build the audience. Make a name for yourself. And then get on Rotten Tomatoes and and have your voice be heard. Uh, By the way, what was the name of that movie you liked? The Farewell. The Farewell. Okay. Yeah, very charming. Is it out? Yeah. You know, it's in limited release. It's in, in it's it's sort of an indie theater. It's an indie film. 
So you may have to go to an indie art house to see it. But if you can, I, I certainly recommend it. It's a very good movie. But it's Asians. <laughs> but, but, yeah. <laughs> darn. Darn. <laughs> I regret having such a good time with Crazy Rich Asians. I should have, I shouldn't have smiled and enjoyed myself so much. I'll have to ask for a <laughs> refund. There was not an appropriate mix of black, Hispanic, <laughs> white, and, and, and Asians in the movie. Good grief! And by the way, I just posted a story um, yesterday on my website about uh, you know Jim Gaffigan, the comedian. Yeah, he's great. Well, he's also doing a ton of acting roles. He's really busy doing supporting players, uh, lead roles. And he talked about how his recent movie, Being Frank, was attacked by critics, not because it wasn't funny or wasn't dramatic or that he was terrible in it, but the female characters in the movie didn't get enough screen time. And so they the critics dinged the movie based on that alone. And he's saying it's a story of a father and son. I, I, how much more time can you give the female characters if the, the thrust of the story is about these two male characters? I mean, he's he's a liberal guy and he's aghast at what's going on within the film criticism community. Good for him. I'm glad to hear that there's at least one that's pointing out how I mean, that's just pure unadulterated dumbassery. Listen, if you go to see a movie, and it's about a mother and daughter. Great. But I'm not going to complain that the guys don't get enough screen time. It's a mother daughter story. And conversely, if it's a father son story, that's where the focus should be. You know, you're just you're just you're, you're just an irrational human being. I don't know. There's there's <laughs> there's no hope for you. You're not the first person to say that. <laughs> but and by the way, before we leave this, I just want to remind everybody the story that we're talking about is on your website hollywoodandtoto.com. But the story is based on a on an article that you read in the Columbia Journalism Review. That yeah, is and- so sad. It is. And by the way, I went and looked up the author on Twitter. I was kind of thinking, I bet he's a hardcore liberal. Sure enough, a whole bunch of liberal posts up there and a lot of pop culture stuff. And again, I don't care what he is, but when you write a story of that fashion and you lean it so hard to the left and you leave out the more significant story about how ideological bias infects reviews, I got to throw the flag down. All right, everybody go read it. Columbia Journalism Review targets white male critics. I, it's just a great example, again, of identity politics and how – and particularly I love the story about Jim Gaffigan because that is that is another example of how this concept of identity politics is causing the left to just consume themselves. It's, a, yeah, it's well, absurd. I don't think we talked about this. We just, we just mentioned it really briefly, but Sarah Silverman said – and she's oh, a very – yes, 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 yes. She lost a gig in a movie that she really wanted and seemed to seem like it was in the bag because the people behind the movie found out that she dressed up in blackface might have been like 11, 12 years ago on her old TV show. Now, she has over the years apologized and apologized and apologized for doing that. But more importantly, it wasn't a racist act. It was she was having a discussion on the show about how the culture treats people who are Jewish and who are black. She was trying to point out that people don't always get treated the same way. She was trying to make a point about bias and bigotry. She wasn't just putting on blackface to be insulting, but none of that mattered. She got fired and she's not happy about it. She's, she's kind of blamed. She said this whole liberal culture of, of this cancel culture is a problem. Well, hello, you've been quiet for years, but when it bit you in the buttocks, all of a sudden, you're complaining about it. Well, welcome to the party, Sarah. I I, I can't stand Sarah Silverman, but, but but at least good for her. I mean, I, I'm I'm sorry that she got fired and she lost the gig, but good for her for being pissed off about it. And to your point, it's this isn't something that she was hiding. It's not like I mean, now obviously <laughs> I didn't know about it, but it, obviously everybody that's involved in Hollywood, this isn't new news. They knew she had done this. <laughs> Now, five years ago, I would have stuck up for her and I would have said this is wrong. Today, given the culture, and I think this is what many conservatives are doing, they're saying, you know what? This is how it has to happen in order to make progress. Enough liberals have to get caught up in the PC mob so they realize how dangerous this is and how unproductive it is and how unfair it is. And until enough liberals get bit, then we might actually see some real progress in the culture. But until then, if it's always conservatives getting thrown in the bus, nothing's going to change. So unfortunately, people like Sarah Silverman have to lose gigs 
to make other people aware of what the situation is. But to be clear, just to make sure nobody misunderstands you, you are standing up for her complaining about it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. And on paper, I get where she was mistreated. I'm not in favor of that. But I think it sounds cruel. I think that people have to get yes. get attacked in this fashion before we all realize we're all in this together. It's a problem. And I, uh, so. I, I agree a thousand percent. And one last point on this issue, um, I, I shall plug my, my the latest podcast episode on, on the Hollywood and Toto podcast interviews a person who wrote a book called Campus Land, and I highly recommend the book. It's a satire set on a college campus, and it's all about this aggressive identity politics culture. The book is excellent. The writer is really a smart fellow, Scott Johnston. It just came out this week, but so ignore my podcast. Go buy that book. I, I think people will really enjoy it. It's very well written. And it's the kind of book where you think, I know it's satire, but boy, it feels ripped from today's headlines. And the name of the book again? Campus Land. Campus Land. All right. We'll go find that. All right. Good, 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 good. All right. Um, from now on, f f for the remainder of this, of this episode of Michael yep. Brown Unplugged, you shall refer to me as Fredo. I'd love to. <laughs> I've been waiting all, all these years to call you Fredo. <laughs> Fredo. But how can, I can't be Fredo because I'm actually the oldest brother. Oh, okay. So it doesn't the is it is it is it the second or third child or is it just the dumb child? I think predominantly it's a dumb child. I'm trying to think what the birth order is on, on the Godfather, <laughs> but <laughs> he's he's not so smart. So uh, that's that's the real issue here. He's the dumb brother in the Godfather series. So, period. <laughs> so you. <laughs> I talked about the. Actually, I was going to ignore this story the entire <laughs> week because I just thought it was so absurd. But I, I, I did make, I did, I actually made fun of it because in my Twitter feed, when the video that Chris, but by the way, we're talking about the video where Chris Cuomo was, and I, and I do think the person who did it was trying to create a scene. Yeah, he was being, he was being a jerk. He was being a jerk. It as particular, and I don't mind it as much, but when the wife and the kid are there, generally speaking, not cool. Not cool. I, and I, so you and I are totally in 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 in, li in alignment on that. So I I, I kind of mentioned it, but I did then find it kind of funny. After in particularly my Twitter feed, all of these Italians started talking about. Wait a minute, we call people Fredo all the time. <laughs> I'm the Fredo in my family, or, you know, my, my sister's the Fredo, and blah, blah, blah. And then there were people that, and this is always funny to me, where on both sides, I don't care who does it, mm -hmm. but they, they go to the Wayback Machine, and they find places where people have either used that word themselves on his own show, or where he himself has used that word. I love it. I love, you know, listen, the media's not going to do it, but the new media between Twitter people and bloggers and podcasters, they're going to hold people accountable, and it is joyous. Oh, it's, it is fantastic. So you sent me a, a tweet from Trevor Noah's The Daily Show. Yeah. What, what are we, what, you, you want me to just play it, or you want to set it up? Quick setup. So you and I, I think, have talked about this in the past. Bill Maher is religiously liberal. And, of course, he's, he's <laughs> completely atheistic, if that's a word. Yeah. But he is probably the most likely to kind of call out his fellow liberals when they do things badly. But second, a distant second, is Trevor Noah, who occasionally will wander off the progressive plantation to say, hey, guys and gals, not cool. So he does that right here in this bit. Maybe not as hard as I'd like, but at least he kind of pokes a little fun at Cuomo for the whole situation. Okay, and I and I haven't listened to it, so to jump on, to kind of glom onto what you said, good for him because anytime, maybe he doesn't do it enough, but whenever <laughs> he does it, he's reaching that audience that you and I will never reach yep. because they're just a different a different demographic, a different political persuasion, everything. So good for him for calling it out. So let's take a listen to what uh uh, Trevor Noah has to say about uh, Fredo. Chris Cuomo. You might know him for always breaking the news, but if you talk trash to him in the streets, the only thing that might end up breaking is your face. 
CNN, standing by host Chris Cuomo after a video went viral showing the anchor threatening a heckler. This video was taken during a heated exchange with an unidentified man who called Cuomo Fredo, which Cuomo insists is a racist slur toward Italians. Now, I, got, I, got now, I want to pause it right there because the, the news anchor says Co- Cuomo did what he did because he insists that it's a racial slur. <laughs> and then you and then you listen to all the times that he's used it or that other people have used it on his program. Now you understand that what he's doing, he's just trying to rationalize the I'm gonna call it bad behavior. Yeah. But I also get that his wife and his daughter were there. So he's kind of trying to get this guy out of his face. I get that. And, and you know, in the past, if you compare anything to the N-word the full weight of the outrage mob comes on you. But because he is a dedicated liberal warrior, it's been mostly quiet. And I think it's also been mostly quiet in this case because I think they also recognize, no, this is not the equivalent of the (laughs) N-word. It's not even apples and kumquats. It couldn't be any more different. Let's continue. It's an insult to your people. It's an insult to your people. It's like the N-word for us. Is that that a cool Thing? You're gonna have a problem. What? What are you gonna I'll, do about it? I'll, I'll ruin your shit. Then. I'll Come throw on. you down these stairs like a punk. Please do. Why? So you, you, don't you don't want to sue? You don't want to sue? Well, why don't you do it? Go then? take a swing. Oh, you call me Fredo. Take a swing. Take a swing. Watch your hands. Take a swing. Wreck your shit. I'll wreck your shit. Yo, Chris Cuomo doesn't mess around. Now I see why CNN makes people fight in separate boxes. That's just workplace safety. I love that. So that's why CNN makes people fight in separate boxes. It's workplace safety. That's that's clever. It's clever. Very clever. All right, here we go. Cuomo's like, if I wasn't in this box, I'd smash your face. (laughs) And look, Cuomo was clearly pissed off because he feels like when this guy called him Fredo, it's a negative Italian stereotype. All right. What's funny to me, though, was that his reaction that he chose uh, also seemed like a negative Italian stereotype. <laughs> that, that's clever. So when, when Trevor Noah says, your reaction was also like an Italian stereotype, <laughs> that, that's fantastic. It's funny <laughs> stuff. Fantastic. You know, uh, like, listen, you when, when the left me? hits itself, it's never with the vigor, it's never with the bleeps, it's never with the full outrage that we get when it's Trump or Senator McConnell or something, but you got to take the scraps when they come, right? Oh, and, and this is a good scrap. This, yeah. This is a good two minute and 30 seconds of scraps, and I'll, I'll take it any day. Yeah, and why didn't Colbert do it? Why didn't Jimmy Kimmel do it? I mean, there's lots of fodder here. All right, let's go. On these stairs, big man. You want to talk to me? You want to talk to me? I'll f-ing break you. And you know, I got to admit, for, for a South African, that's a pretty darn good Italian accent he's got. You know, over the years, you know, when he was first installed in The Daily Show, everyone's like, oh, he's no he's no John Stewart. I think he's become a better performer since then. So I, I think he's uh, gotten some chops, as like, dramatically speaking, you know, which you need for humor, too. Yes. Well, he, he pulled it off right there. All right, here we yeah. go. So since this video went viral, (laughs) there's a big conversation now over whether the word Fredo is a slur. Now, some are saying it's a reference to the dumb brother in The Godfather, okay? Uh, Because, like, you know, Cuomo has his brother, and then he's, like, the dumber one who's in the news and in entertainment. But some are saying it's also an ethnic slur. In fact, Cuomo himself claimed it's like calling an Italian person the N-word. Yeah. So to find out if that's true, we're joined by Roy Wood Jr., everybody! (laughs) Oh, this is good. I didn't realize this was coming. <laughs> he brings on a black man. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Boy, is, is calling an Italian Fredo the same as calling a black person the N-word? <laughs> Where would you know, everyone? <laughs> that was good. That was very, very clever. Do you think it's kind of upsetting Trevor Noah that he could that a conservative leaning podcast is even playing and or celebrating his humor? I bet he's probably thinking, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I I, I can't I can't give them this. 
Oh, I guarantee you, he has no clue who you and I are. Or oh, I know. I know. I know. Just, about just I, on, I know. On paper. I, know. <laughs> I know. Oh, that was that was fantastic. That was very yeah. very good. Maybe we should um, maybe we should explain to people why over the past several weeks we've not had any view clips. You have a theory about that. I think that they take a brief vacation toward the end of the summer because I'm not seeing any newsbusters items or anything. And so I usually I kind of in my research and sort of circling the web, I find stuff. You can't help but find stuff when it comes to the view. But I just haven't seen anything lately. But I, I, I think if last year's memory serves me, I think they take a brief time out and then they kind of start their new season, as it were. And hopefully Megan McCain will be part of it. Well, let's just um... – I know I'm having a little bit of withdrawals, but knowing that they <laughs> will be coming back, I'll, uh-huh. I'll, I'll try to survive until after Labor Day or whenever it is. It's a reason to keep going. It is. a, re- it's, a re- it's a reason to, keep, to, to stay alive. That's right. Knowing the view will come back. <laughs> hey, thanks for coming on today. Good to see you. My pleasure. All right. I'll talk to you later. And because it's Friday, the National Post, which is a newspaper in Canada, says that a Canadian aircraft controller in Nova Scotia who was caught loudly masturbating by co-workers on multiple occasions and who was eventually fired for his work through a totally understandable Hail Mary, trying to keep his job and at least a little bit of his dignity. But ultimately, the courts were like, you know, no, no, you're just uh, weird and and you got to go. Back in 2016, in a... this man in question, whose name was not given, who do you really want to know his name? I don't. I don't know. He was spotted in a bathroom stall at work on several occasions by multiple coworkers, quote, breathing heavily, making erratic movements, and moaning. Now, why do people jump to an absurd conclusion here that he might have been masturbating, breathing heavily? Maybe he just ran up the stairs making erratic movements. Have you ever tried in a public restroom in a stall to try to get the stupid toilet paper dispenser to work and moaning? Maybe he had a stomach ache. The employee was confronted by work about the incidents and was told that if whatever was happening was medical in nature, he needs to tell the company immediately. So the, the employee was like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about, but yeah, sure, I've got problems, If or if I have problems, I'll let you know. So for a time, the uh, on-site work masturbation stopped. But by April of 2018, the same guy just couldn't help himself any longer. I mean, you know, come on. Couldn't help himself any longer, right? <laughs> Co-workers once again started noticing, noticing that he was, that there were definitely no longer friends, uh, well, with him when he was in the bathroom doing things. Now, I find that sentence odd because... If I go to the restroom with friends, like in a public place, generally we don't talk. But this time, his co-worker said, his behavior was even brasher than before. Once again, they reported hearing heavy breathing, moaning sounds, and sounds consistent with orgasm. What, what is that? Can somebody, can somebody... Nothing. It's just that all men are sure it never happened to them, and most women at one time or another have done it, so you do the math. You don't think that I can tell a difference? No. Get out of here. Ooh. Oh. Ooh. Are you okay? Oh. God. Oh. 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 Oh, God. Oh, yeah, right there. Oh. 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 Oh, God. Oh. Yes. 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 Yes! 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 Oh! 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 Oh!
bad. Oh. I'll have what she's having. <laughs> oh, Harry met Sally. The employee was once again investigated, and this time he was like, yeah, okay, I go to the bathroom, watch porn on my phone, and masturbate. And I don't have a good excuse that I, can, that I can think of at the moment. So, of course, the man openly masturbating at work was fired. But then at some point, he probably went on to WebMD and checked out masturbating at work, and he diagnosed himself with a sex addiction. He contested his firing on the grounds that I have to watch Red Tube and stroke off at work because me am addicted to P's and V's. But the employer disagreed. The case went to arbitration. The employer won because the bar to clear for justifying, well, you know, doing that at work is higher than the moon. Nice try. Thanks for playing. <laughs> Good grief. It, we live in a bizarro world. So I don't really get this, but apparently Burger King is now pitching their value meals and they're using depressed people to do it. Not everybody wakes up happy. Sometimes you feel sad, scared, crappy. All I ask is that you let me feel my way. Down. Can't wait to leave this closed minded town. My boss is such a freaking creep. I just told him to go f himself. My student loan. I'm never moving out of my parents' home. Just got ghosted. Should have known. Pretty sure I'll end up alone. They say I'm too young to raise my baby girl. Take your opinions and suck it, world. meal not everybody wakes up happy but give me a burger king burger and i'll be all fine well crack up some prozac or something and put it over the top and I, then i guess you'll feel fine man oh man it's well it's friday it's friday so what do you expect well and because and because it is friday i imagine that tamar and i will be going to uh probably have some mexican food and a little tequila this evening and whenever I think about Mexican food, I think about sopapillas, which reminds me of, well, what is a sopapilla, actually? It's fried bread. And then you pour honey in it. Unhealthy eating everywhere. I was in Arizona and New Mexico, and there are people eating fried bread. There are stands that sell only fried bread. And I saw that, and I was like, I found my people. <laughs> fried bread. I eat unhealthy, but come on. I know a donut's fried bread, but at least we don't call it fried bread. I mean, at what point do you even feel comfortable eating something called fried bread? Have you ever eaten cake in the shower? A couple times. You're ready for fried bread. Ever eat in your car so you don't have to share with your children? Every day. You're ready for fried bread. And, I, and I'm ready for some fried bread, too. I'll just call this Sopapilla. Hey, everybody, thanks for listening to this week's episodes of Michael Brown Unplugged. I really appreciate you doing it. Everybody have a great weekend, and I'll talk to you again Monday.